The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis. Dallas selects Emmett Smith, running back from Florida. We are counting down the days. Closer and closer, we inch toward the NFL Draft on April 23rd. We're now 21 days away. It's getting crazy. Three weeks from today, we will find a new era of NFL talent ushered into the league. And we're going to break it all down for you here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show as we inch closer and closer into finding out exactly what the ingredients are going to be for this Dallas Cowboys team and the roster that they're going to make up heading into 2020. Kyle Yeomans here, David Hellman alongside Kevin Turner, and we've got a special guest back on the draft show for the first time since when? Mobile, since we were down at the Senior Bowl. Bucky Brooks joins the draft show. Bucky, thanks for for stopping in, and of course, uh, we're glad to have you here on the draft show presented by Miller Lite. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. And it's going to be a, a fun one overall. And I mentioned those ingredients, and before we really get into uh, draft talk, The ingredients for uh, a great roster is just like it is for a great pizza. And our friends at Papa John stopped by and gave us a uh, each a a personal pizza to to celebrate. Of course, the fact that they are still delivering, and you can go out and you can't if you you look at even KT's got one down there as well. So we've all got these personal pizzas that that we're showing that if you can't even decide what to order, you can go and get two picks for six dollars each. Grab either a medium one topping like we have, or you could go get something else perfectly paired, maybe wings, a brownie. We don't judge here on the draft show. All of these different things, two picks for $6 each, available for a limited time at DFW Austin and Waco area locations. Dave wanted the wings, and I don't think his have been delivered yet, but I know he's a big wing guy overall. Uh, You you bet your butt I am. Great great plug, Kyle. Fantastic. And I can't wait to eat my wings later. I know you're you're going to be uh, nose deep in it, but let's go looking at really the past week of the Dallas Cowboys, and of course, even prior to last week when we did our, our one round mock draft here on the draft show, we talked about the uh, the potentials for interior defensive linemen and who had already just been uh, taken care of, at least whenever it comes to the signings for the Dallas Cowboys. Gerald McCoy, now Don Terry Poe joining the Cowboys, each on a couple of multi-year deals. And then yesterday, we also had an edge rusher signed by the Dallas Cowboys, Mr. Alden Smith, a former pro bowler. We're going to get into all of that, but I kind of want to start with the defensive tackles, guys, and and how this kind of affects the draft plans for the Dallas Cowboys. And KT, I, I want to start with you. I mean, these are two bigger bodies in the middle of this defensive line, but does that kind of sway you from, I know, what you were wanting early in the draft show process, which was Javon Kinlaw? Does this sway you at all, having McCoy and Poe? No, it really doesn't change too much for me. Like, I still want to take the best player. And I feel like we are in a situation where Kinlaw at 17 does seem like that's kind of sketchy. Like, it might not happen. So, um I, if Kinlaw falls to you at 17, I, I'm still going to do that. But, uh, you know, you still take the best player at 17. This roster's too close. Take the best player. And, uh, you know, you'll figure out your defensive end problem at some point, And maybe that's where Chase on comes into play. Bucky? No, I, I, I think it, it, it opens up the board. I think it's now just sit and take the best player available. Uh, when you're sitting there at 17, depending upon when the run at quarterback goes, you're going to have a good player fall to you at 17. So from a defensive standpoint, if Javon Kinlaw is there, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, when it comes to the edge rushers that could be available, I think you're talking about a A.J. Epinesa. You may be talking about a Chase on, and then your two of Gross Matos. It really just depends on how Mike Nolan views the edge rusher class and what he wants in that position. Even though they're bringing in Alden Smith, I don't think he precludes or changes your draft plans. I still think you're trying to find a blue chip player that can come in and play right away. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really funny. The Cowboys are doing exactly what they always do, 
but they still find a way to throw you a curveball or two, right? Because we're not used to seeing the big names. We're certainly not used to seeing the big body nose tackles like Dontari Poe, not during Rob Marinelli's tenure at any rate. Uh, and anybody that saw Alden Smith coming, go buy some lotto tickets because that's about as big of a curveball as I've ever seen in my career. Um, but it still it fits their their game plan, right? Like they're not going to be big spenders. They're bargain hunters. They're paying Poe five something million a year and change. I think Smith's base salary is only two million with incentives built in. But what does it do? Bucky's exactly right. It opens up the board because the the reason I've been talking about Caleb on Chase on this whole time is because it looked like they needed to draft a defensive end. Now. Alden Smith and potentially Randy Gregory shouldn't change that need whatsoever, but it puts you in a position where you don't have to spend that pick on an edge rusher if you don't want to. I think where it gets really fun – I'm sorry, Kyle. I think where it gets really fun is what happens if Ken Law's gone, Chason's gone, whoever they have graded his cornerback to, maybe it's C.J. Henderson, maybe he's gone – like, at 17, you're sitting there going, I kind of want to go back, and you can't always do that. So, Or you want to th- join Team 40 Burger, Kevin. That's the answer. All right. Get yourself See, a wide receiver. Being, are there <laughs> any of the top three yeah. receivers going to be there for Team 40 Burger at 17? That's not a guarantee either, especially if you look at some of the guys that are going to go off the board early. I mean, do we want to have the conversation about Justin Jefferson? Because we can do that. What about Jalen Rager? Jalen Rager? How about Brandon Ayuk? Are those too high for 17? Are those, I, mean, I think all three of those are too high for 17. Yeah, I think I think those guys are a little too high. But if we talk about every everyone can't go in the first 16 picks. Um, can't have a ton of quarterbacks. We can't have all the playmakers, all the defensive guys go. There's going to be a good player that's sitting right there at 17. I think what you've done by getting the veteran players, you've kind of assured that at least – Opening day, the, the start of the season, you have someone that can try it out with the, the ones. Now it's about what's the blue chip player? Find the blue chip player, take that blue chip player regardless of the position or the need. And it, it's kind of starting to look toward now that you've kind of filled some of these needs in free agency, like a defensive tackle, like an edge rusher. Potentially, I, and I'm just saying you've filled needs with bodies. Like David said, these aren't necessarily the be-all, end-all moves. These are moves that have kind of set you up for success to add talent, young talent, cheap talent through the draft, but also have some veteran presence and maybe a safety net if those de- don't necessarily work out. I mean, look back to, to 2019's draft. You thought you had a gem of a pick. And Connor McGovern in the third round to pick 90, he didn't play all last year. That's not because he's a bad player. He just had some health issues. And if you were relying on him to be a, a starting interior offensive lineman heading into 2019, it would have been a lot different or a lot more disappointing the fact that he was unhealthy. Now you've got kind of a safety net underneath you. You're starting to build a little bit of a roster. And I see how it opens up the board, but I kind of want to keep – a, a, a mindset on defensive line right now and ask you guys this question which part of the defensive line is now the highest draft need is it interior or is it on the edge I honestly definitely um, go ahead Dave well, I'm sorry Kate I, I, I don't think anything has changed I, like I just said mm-hmm. I, I still look at right end as a huge problem spot and Alden Smith, is it's super intriguing because the upside is crazy if it pans out, but how can you count on that? I believe right now he has not been reinstated. Obviously, the Cowboys are no. pretty optimistic that he will be, or else they wouldn't have signed him, but he has not been reinstated. Neither has Randy Gregory. Gregory hasn't played in more than a year. Alden Smith hasn't played since 2015. Think about what you were doing in 2015. I mean, that's so... <laughs> It's crazy. Uh, so I, I can't sit here and count on either of those guys. I don't feel great about what was already on the roster. Tyrone Crawford coming mm-hmm. off hip surgery and then a bunch of young players that haven't done a whole lot. It's It has not been addressed to the point where I'm not worried about it. Um, so I still, you know, Gerald McCoy and Dontari Poe are, are starter caliber players. They still don't have anything on the right side that just makes me feel super great. I know the game is, you know, try to take the best player you can, but 
Would you guys agree with me that you feel better about the defensive tackle depth in round two than maybe the edge rusher depth on day two in general? I would agree. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I think, I think you're kind of answering the question for yourself right there. Uh, because yeah. the fall off in edge rushers from first round to second round, if they're going to make a move, they have to make a move in the first round. Um, that defensive end need outside linebacker, however you want to call it, that edge rusher player, they need. Um, I think with Randy Gregory and Alden Smith, those are kind of bonus picks. If either one of those guys materializes and turns into a, a prominent player, that's great. I still think they have to enter the draft thinking, man, it'd be great to be able to get an edge rusher, a playmaker, someone that can be disruptive off the edge at 17. And then it's a matter of this defense, 4-3, 3-4, Whoever they pick has to be a guy that kind of fits what Mike Nolan wants or envisions in terms of that playing style as an edge player. And a lot of it determines on, okay, after Chase Young goes, who are the next ones to go? And will any of those guys be available when they get to 17? Plenty of options for the Cowboys at 17. And, I mean, you could even throw secondary into the mix. I mean, we've talked about a corner or a safety really since the draft show started about 85 days ago, uh, just based off of the fact that you need a safety. You still need a corner. You've lost Byron Jones, and even with the addition of HaHa Clinton Dix at the safety spot, you're not necessarily sold in that spot as well. So with all of this being said, and if you would have asked me this question, and if I would have asked you guys this question three weeks ago, it might have been a lot different, but Right now, as we sit 21 days from the NFL draft, what are your top three needs for the Dallas Cowboys in order at this moment? Ooh, wow, that's tough. Mm. Because it's honestly, not an easy like, question. It's really not. Um, but Buck, Bucky, I want to hear. I mean, we we've been doing this for three months. I want to hear your thoughts on it. Just a new a new perspective. Uh, I think it has to be somewhere on the defensive side of the ball. I think offensively they're good enough to, to, to play at a high level. Defensively, uh, edge rusher, corner, safety. Um, I would say edge rusher because the best way to protect the back end is to make sure that you're able to generate pressure. Uh, when you go back and you look at Mike Nolan's history and the fact that Jim Tom Sula, uh, when they had a role, What you want to do is be able to dominate people up front, find an edge rusher that can get home consistently. If it's not one of those guys, then it has to be a top flight cornerback. Uh, someone that can play man to man, but also has enough in the toolbox to be able to get after people in a variety of different ways. And then safety, uh, the thing about the safety class, I'm not overwhelmed with any of the top safeties. And so I don't know if in the first round you have to go and get a safety because they all kind of they're okay. I don't think they're, they're stars at the top of the board. So I would focus on somewhere in that, that front line, somewhere on the edge, someone that can, can make it happen, someone that can create sacks and really disrupt the play of the passing game. That's where it gets real fun from what Dave was saying earlier, though, because I think that fourth need might be wide receiver three. Like, yeah. And it just depending on there, if the best player was a wide receiver – whether it be one of the big three or whoever you're in love with, the big three being Jerry, Judy, uh, Henry Ruggs, and CeeDee Lamb. I, just, I find that kind of fascinating of how they would think with an offensive-minded head coach coming in here as well, if the best player graded was their fourth need. That's where things get really fun on draft night. I would agree with Bucky 100%, though. You look at their, their depth chart, I really like their move of bringing back Anthony Brown. and I know he was cheap. And Cheeto's going into year three, not, not not giving up on Cheeto at all. Year four, so, uh, year four, KT. Year four, I'm sorry. So so a defensive end, time flies, man. Except when you're quarantined and time goes by really slow. Um, <laughs> but like, you have recognizable names there at cornerback. It's not, you know, you've got to fill in for Byron Jones. But we're talking about big time gambles on Alden Smith and Randy Gregory and look, Tyrone Crawford's coming back and maybe he could play some defensive end for you, but. So I agree 100% with Bucky. It's it's right defensive end. That is their number one need for sure. I agree does with make everything. it a little bit easier. I I'm go for it, Dave. I'm so conflicted though. I mean, I agree with everything Bucky said too. It's hard to ignore any of those needs. The cornerback situation is kind of terrifying because uh, Anthony yeah. Brown is really the only sure thing you have now and in the future. I love Jordan yeah. Lewis, but even if he's good, he's in a contract year. 
But having said all of that, I can't stop thinking about wide receiver. Um, I, you know, <laughs> deep, no, I'm, and I mean, I know we joke about we joke about drafting one and having this great offense, but like, isn't a strategy for success surrounding your quarterback with the best options possible? Like, yeah, you can you could sign Tavon Austin and throw him in there to be your slot, but like. Is that the best strategy when you consider all of the great wide receivers that are available in this draft? And if you want your $31 million, maybe $35 million quarterback to succeed, I want as many good players around him as possible. And you can talk to me all day about how a great quarterback should elevate lesser players. I don't care. Give the guy talent. I mean, Pat Mahomes just won a Super Bowl surrounded by Pro Bowl caliber skill players. And so I can't call wide receiver a top three need. But I really think it would be in their best interest to address that opening with with a high caliber player. That's, I mean, I don't know. That's why, just me. Why? Why is it not surprising to me the fact that David Hellman loses sleep at night thinking about drafting wide receivers? Is that is that just the most <laughs> David Hellman thing you've ever heard of? I mean, do you want do you want to like throw Cedric Wilson out there, or do you want to go get? One of these 10 million badass receivers. Like, there's so many of them. <laughs> See, but you can get can one of those in the third difference. and the fourth round, though. You could, and and they they might. But, I mean, you still you have a decline. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they have to do it at 17, but okay. I would argue, like, one of their first three picks, you're going to have a chance to draft a really good wide receiver. That's all. I think, Dave, I think you, you, you hit on something. When you talk about in, in the second and third rounds, uh, if you go back and look at Mike McCarthy's history, that's typically how the Green Bay Packers did it under his watch. They would find guys in the second and third round, guys that could come in, they would develop them, um, and away they would go from Jordy Nelson to Greg Jennings and on and on. And so I think that might be the sweet spot for the Dallas Cowboys. We've talked about the depth and the talent in this wide receiver class. It's kind of been proven that you can get a number one receiver in the second round. We saw A.J. Brown pop for Tennessee. We saw Terry McLaurin in the third round pop for the Washington Redskins. Mm. Michael Thomas, who some are considering the best receiver in football, was the second rounder. So if the Cowboys know exactly what they want, they can find a guy in the second round. But you're right. They have to get a tier one player, a blue chip player in the first round, someone that could come in and immediately make a significant contribution. I, I like that you mentioned that, Bucky, because the Cowboys, obviously, they do weigh in, like, like a lot of teams do, they weigh in road mapping the draft. Where's the depth of the draft? But uh, You mentioned all those Packers wide receivers. Devontae Adams a couple years ago was second round. And the Cowboys had a little bit of success in the third round with Michael Gallup, too. Yeah. So maybe they're like, hey, we can get a receiver later. We just did it with Michael Gallup. Let's go – you know, somewhere else and, and really attack the defense in the first couple rounds. You know, and it's kind of funny that you bring that up and you talk about how in the past they've tend to kind of put their, I, I guess, their priorities in other positions other than maybe the corners and the safeties. And with this being a, a different a different coaching staff, that may change. It may stay the same. We don't know. We won't know until April 23rd. However, with the moves that they've kind of been making throughout the course of this offseason, and this is going to kind of go back to, to what I was talking about with Dave and trying to get to poke at it with, with Hellman just a minute ago, but I, I could see them now starting to kind of put the pieces around, make sure there's a safety net, so that way if the best player available at 17 is a wide receiver, either C.D. Lamb, Jerry, Judy, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Raker, doesn't matter. Sure any of those guys, it makes it a possibility to where you're able to make a pick there at a wide receiver. What do yeah, you do with the best overall players in offensive tackle? Take them. Ooh, that's a good <laughs> question. All right. No hesitation. Take no them. hesitation. Yeah, because when you look at Tyron Smith, like how many more years does Tyron Smith have at a high level yeah. with the injuries and the slow decline in play? If there's a top offensive tackle there, you can't go wrong. Um, I think the Cowboys are at a point where you can't go wrong just stockpiling talent. And you take a talented offensive tackle and say he can't play uh, mm -hmm. the first year or whatever. There are ways that you can get them onto the field, whether it's using six offensive line sets, whether it's finding a way to either move them inside or outside. There's a number of ways that you can take a blue chip talent and get them on the field. I think there are plenty of blue chip opportunities throughout the entirety of the first round, and we'll address that more and more as we go along. And we've talked about pick 17 
at nauseum for God knows how long here on the draft show. But we're going to come back. When we come back, we've got Twitter on the 20. And then after Twitter on the 20, we're going to talk about some of our favorite day three prospects. As we continue yeah. rolling along, you're watching the DallasCowboys.com draft show presented by Miller Lite. I'm Jay Novacek, former tight end for the Dallas Cowboys. Back in the day, I was the guy who always got the tough yards, and that's why I run with John Deere today. In fact, I have a John Deere 3025E tractor that can handle any yard work I need to do, even the tough yards way out back. So if you have one acre or a thousand, John Deere has the equipment that's just right for you. Visit a John Deere dealer today and run with us. We are the official tractor provider of your Dallas Cowboys. Essilor is a proud sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys, helping fans see more and do more with our best vision solutions. Our lens technologies reveal a world more beautiful than you can imagine. For a limited time, get the Essilor Next Gen offer. When you buy the latest generation of Transitions lenses with select Essilor lenses, you can choose a second pair of clear lenses for free with qualifying frame purchases. Restrictions apply. Find a participating eye care professional by visiting EssilorUSA.com. Essilor. See more. Do more. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys? Jack Black. Right now you can get the Jack Black Starter, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The starter includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word TEAMJB. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys. The Jack Black Starter, 10 bucks. Free shipping! Your new apartment's big. Such a great deal. Uh, it's okay. Just okay? What's not too... Right above the subway! Well, I bet you don't even notice it after the... That's my neighbor, Angus! A deal that's just okay is not okay. Get a great deal with America's Best Network. Come into an AT&T store to find out how to get one of our popular smartphones for $0 down. Based on GWS1 score September 2019. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Welcome back here to the Draft Show here on DallasCowboys.com on Always Presented by Miller Lite. And talking about Miller Lite, I want to take our hats off to our official draft podcast partner who, as many of you know, is the only beer of the Dallas Cowboys. And right now in many of our communities where restaurants and bars are being closed down and leaving plenty of employees without work, the Miller Lite Company is is doing their help to uh, help those that are affected the most by donating a million dollars to a virtual chip tip jar, excuse me, that supports bartender emergency assistant program uh, for those that would like to learn more you can go online you can visit vis- or virtualtips.org is what it is virtualtips.org a big Dallas Cowboys cheers to Miller Lite and all of those helping those in the service industry for sure and it's definitely a tough time for all those out there hope you're staying safe and hope we're giving you a little bit of a break from your normal uh, shelter in place quarantine times with a little bit of draft talk and Let's go ahead and hop into some Twitter on the 20. Twitter on the 20. So Twitter on the 20, of course, now with Bucky Brooks joining the squad. But, Bucky, we're going to give a couple questions to you here in a couple of moments. But this first one, I'm going to start off asking Mr. David Hellman. And I saw uh, saw this from Donald Walker on Twitter, and he tweeted out at us. He said, David, who is one LSU guy that you would hate to see the Dallas Cowboys draft. And I'm saying this because last week on the mock draft, <laughs> there were a lot of LSU guys in that first round. Some of them were picked by you, including Caleb on chase on, but I want to know if one LSU guy out of the bunch, even some of the top names that you would not like to see the Cowboys draft. Yeah. I, uh, I'm catching a lot of hell for driving the Caleb on chase on train. Cause people think it's Homerism on my part, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I can think of a couple right off the bat. I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, okay, I'd be fine drafting any of them. It just depends on when. Um, personally, mm-hmm. I don't really get the hype on Thaddeus Moss. Um, not, as a, not as a top 100 pick. Like, I see people talk about him as, like, a third round, like, maybe even, like, a late second round pick. I don't see it. I think he's, he's a good player. 
I'm not sure people would talk about him that way if he wasn't Randy's son. Um, I'd be happy to draft him like sometime on day three, but I would not want to draft him, you know, with the third round pick. That's way too high. Uh, same thing goes for Richard Lawrence. I think he's a good player. I think he's he's really tenacious and he sets the edge really well. He could be like a good utility defensive lineman. I would be disappointed uh, picking him in the top 100 picks. So those would be my two. I'd be happy to draft either of them on day three, but those are not top 100 type of guys in my opinion. Okay, so now that we've got the LSU question out of the way, I'm going to start with Bucky here and KT. I want to get your thought process on this too because I know both of you have looked at this, but uh, this one comes from our guy Jeremy, or actually this comes from Michael, excuse me, and he says, who are the top kick returners in the draft this year? Who? Oh, Quick man, stab this... at special teams. Yeah, I mean, like, people people like those guys. Um, you know, it, it, it's unique because some of it is you're trying to project guys at the next level that could do it, but a guy that I would love to see in the return game would be Brandon Ayuk from Arizona mm-hmm. State. Ooh, yeah. I think the, the common denominator for the great returners, they have a level of physicality and toughness with the ball in their hands, and they also have some, some special qualities that pop. Uh, we could throw C.D. Lamb in that mix, but Brandon Ayuk, to me, is a guy that has special, special traits. I think Jalen Rager would also be a fantastic kick returner, um, you know, just because the explosiveness with the ball in the hands. Typically, those guys are the ones that really excel at the next level. No, I agree uh, 100% with those guys. And another guy I want to throw out there, and the Cowboys do draft a lot of Boise State guys, is John Hightower. Mm-hmm. Um, he could give you some some return uh, flexibility uh, as well. So, and more of a day three guy, I think, in John Hightower in this wide receiver class. But real a guy I like, a guy who's fun for a creative offense, could do some things, but also return kicks for you. Dave, you got anybody? Hmm. Think it, I mean, we talk about him all the time, but I, I'd let Lynn Bowden Jr. do just about anything. <laughs> like, that guy can handle 19 million different jobs. Um, I'm trying to think, like, what year Isaiah McKenzie was the Georgia guy that came out? I don't have any, yeah. like, kick return specialists in mind. Um but I'm also perfectly happy letting Tony Pollard do that in the future, so it's it's not something that yeah. I thought a lot about. Yeah, and I think I would like Pollard in that spot too. Some guys that I know we've talked about before because they were both Senior Bowl guys, but uh, James Prochet out of SMU, wide receiver who returned a couple of kicks during his time at SMU, and then uh, I know some of the safeties have been mentioned in that category as well, like a Kyle Duggar from Lenore Ryan. Yeah, I know Duggar. he's been – uh, in that conversation, he was returning kicks throughout the the Senior Bowl week as well. Um, so I think there's multiple opportunities and, and multiple players that can come out of the draft. I would, like Dave just said, I wouldn't necessarily tab them as specialists by any means coming out as return specialists. But I think they're going to make an impact in special teams, and if not, Tony Pollard's going to be there. So I like that one overall. Okay, so. We don't have Jeff Cavanaugh here, who is the king of the comp picks, but with everyone here, with the extra comp picks coming next year, third, fourth, and fifth rounds, how aggressive for Dallas have they been in free agency, and do you think Dallas trades some extra picks this year to help sure up some of the wide receiver and cornerback and safety positions out of next year's draft? Trade some of those extra picks. That's a great question. So, okay. So I mean, they. Lo- I mean, they're they're obviously going to get comp picks for Byron Jones and Robert Quinn, mm-hmm. uh, Randall Cobb as well, most likely. Um, and they haven't made a signing that should affect that, have they? Because uh, Poe and McCoy. Oh uh, well, they might. Uh, they'll probably lose one for Gerald McCoy, won't they? But not Dontari. Probably. And certainly yeah. not mm-hmm. Alvin Smith. Um. Yeah, I I could see that, but I don't see it being like a super aggressive situation, like you know, like a mega trade. If you think back to um the the Xavier Woods trade a couple years ago that made us so happy, I think they traded a future sixth or a future fifth to get up in the sixth round and get him. Uh, I think they made that trade with New York. 
I could see them doing something mm-hmm. like that, where they're like, hey, we've got three or four picks coming next year. We can afford to make this deal. Um, I could certainly see them doing something like that. I don't think it's going to be some sort of blockbuster. But if there's a guy they like and they need to get up 10 or 15 spots to get him on day three, I could see them doing something like that. For the most part, they, they, they're sitting and picking in the Will McClay you know, era, for the most part. What we have seen them do a couple times, though, is trade for a player. I mean, the table on Austin trade. That's so true. Trade too. a pick for a, for mm-hmm. a player on another roster. Uh, I would just say uh, come at me with that question after they sign Jadavion Young Clowney. Just kidding. Ooh. Maybe not. <laughs> We're having fun. Don't put that thought in the air. I mean, it would be great if they did it, but I just don't want to disappoint people. God, Bucky, what do you think here. about the possibility? Well, I think, I think what you're doing with the com- compensatory picks, you're just trying to load up the war chest. So if there is a player or something that you want, uh, you have capital. But you also see that uh, top executives, what they do is they always try and accumulate multiple picks in the next year's draft to be able to come up around. We've seen the Buffalo Bills do that. We've seen other teams try to use that to kind of put sweetener on deals. And so it's always advantageous to have a number of compensatory picks available. I don't know if you're necessarily thinking about next year and what could be in the wide receiver class or whatever next year, but I think for this year, you just kind of like to have the ammunition just in case a talented player falls within range. Okay, this 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 may be too insane. I mean, I'm sorry. If, if I, I'm not trying to de- derail things. We could be quick here. <laughs> Hypothetically, this thing doesn't clear up and there's no football. What happens to the draft next year? Oh, wow. Like, well, does I think that you affect maybe... your thinking at all as a front office? You have to think about that, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you necessarily think about that. I think you, you kind of prepare as if everything is going to proceed um, as is. I think you have your long-term strategy where uh, you're thinking about your team, you're looking at your team not only for this year but the next few years. And you want to make decisions yeah. to ensure that you're able to compete at a high level for the next few years. And so as you're stockpiling picks, it's kind of one of these things where you want to retool and rebuild while you're still winning. And so if you can kind of forecast ahead to what the needs will be, um, you try and make picks and try and kind of stockpile uh, picks for that. A lot of it it will, will be determined like when you have your quarterback and your quarterback is under wraps, it's kind of easier to figure out how to build the rest of your team around that. Uh, because there shouldn't be, hopefully, any uncertainty around the quarterback, it should be easier for the Cowboys to kind of build in spite of all the uncertainty that may go on with COVID-19 and what may or may not happen with drafts. Well, and I think an answer to your question, KT, could also come kind of from what you see from other leagues. I mean, you look at right now, Major League Baseball is having to do a little bit of adjusting because the majority of their draft prospects – at least the ones coming out of college and even some of them out of high school have been granted an extra year of eligibility. And so there's going to be a little bit of uh, a break and there's just not going to be as many prospects overall. And so the MLB draft over the next couple of, or at least next year or this summer, I guess, is when it would be. This June is usually when they'll have it, if it even stays the same. Instead of having 40 rounds, they're going to five rounds, and it's condensing quite a bit. So I don't know if that would even end up happening for the NFL draft. But like you said, Bucky, uh, I know as a team you have to go like normal moving forward. Should things kind of change, then you go and adjust. But uh, that's definitely a great question overall, KT, and it's something that uh, I don't know of a whole lot of – front offices or at least a whole lot of media has even thought about that kind of possibility just yet now moving on to our next question and this one comes from jeremy on twitter are there any players in the draft that you have taken completely off of your boards whether it be because of medical or otherwise also actually we'll we'll answer the second question first let's start with that first question because it kind of shifts gears a little bit but any players that have fallen off of your board just yet uh, because of character or, or injuries? Anything. I, I would say no. There are players who aren't on my board because I didn't have a, you know, I gave them a PFA grade. But mm-hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't taken anyone off my board for character uh, issues or anything, anything like that or injuries or anything. You know, the tough thing right now is because of the, the flux of the combine, the lack of combine medical rechecks, and then the mm-hmm. pro days. 
<coughs> it's been a slow trickling in of information. And so um, teams will be uh, go up to the last minute before they get all the character background stuff on the players. And so we won't find out about some of those things. But there's a really good player who has an injury history who may not be on a lot of boards, and that is Natain Muti from Fresno mm-hmm. State, the offensive guard. He is a guy that on tape, when you see him, look, he's dominating at the point of attack. But because he's had a series of injuries, there are a lot of teams that are going to completely kind of back away from him. And with all of the uncertainty this year, a player like that who normally a team would throw a dart at, I don't know where he falls in this year's draft because people won't be able to really dig in hard on the medical without all the additional time and stuff that you normally would have. This is this feels like I mean obviously it's a weird year. I mean I don't need to explain that, but I can't remember a year where there was so little information, you know, hovering in the air about players. You know, it's it's around this time, you know, word starts trickling out. Obviously, you know, the the Maurice Hurst was the big one that happened at the combine. But this is the time of year where, you know, you start to hear that so and so's got a, a knee issue or there's a cartilage problem and. I wonder, you know, without without teams seeing these guys in the flesh, I wonder if that slowed down that trickle of information. It's honestly probably great for agents because they try to hide that stuff anyway. And, you know, it's just another wrinkle that makes this draft so unique and interesting compared to other ones. Well, and I think that kind of transitions into the second part of Jeremy's question. He said, is there any way – to see who these teams are calling with those Skypes, with those Zoom and, uh, I guess, WebEx meetings that you're you're ending up having to go to for meeting these players. Because normally we're getting the 30 visits by now, and that would have already been at our forefront to see exactly who the Cowboys or insert team name here would be looking at with their 30 visits. We would have had Dallas Day already, or at least getting up to Dallas Day. So there's plenty of question marks around it but is there any way that this information is going to get released at some point i just follow uh dave hellman's twitter account and wait on him to tweet it out (laughs) oh yeah yeah that's that's exactly what you should do because you know that that won't get me in trouble at all (laughs) (laughs) and bucky i feel like you might have a an answer to this yeah, so the thing is, like, the league has put some stipulations on the, the amount of times, like, guys can kind of FaceTime and do those things because you have to log it and get it all the way in because the league being the league, executives would be grinding prospects hard. But we begin, <coughs> excuse me, to hear about some of the top prospects being on FaceTime, having these Skype interviews with teams. And I think that is going to be the big way, the way of the world as we go forward because – Regardless of whatever is happening and what's preventing teams from getting face-to-face with people, you still have to try and get to know the prospects. And as much as we want to think about it being a little more conservative this year in terms of teams not gambling, there's still going to be some teams that take some chances based on a couple of conversations that they may have with a prospect and the conversations that they may have with that person's representation. Uh, you could see those guys have more sway than normal because you just won't have the opportunity to get them in your room and sit across from them and have those eyeball-to-eyeball conversations. There's, I mean, it, with all of the question marks up in the air with how this draft is going to be kind of even conducted from a team standpoint, I mean, right now facilities are still closed around the NFL. There's a reason we're not up at the star right now. It's because we're not allowed in the building because the NFL has said so and for the the safety of everybody involved, no doubt about it. But it does still present kind of an issue whenever it comes to communication and some of the information that's flying around. One final question here on Twitter on the 20, and this comes from Dylan on Twitter. He sent a message. He said, can we get a deeper conversation about all of the corners that could go between 17 and 51, get some perspective on which to be happy with if the Cowboys do, in fact, go for cornerback in the first round at 17. So kind of exactly where those corners lie right in the middle of that that jumbled mass of corners between 17 and 51. Mm. That's like it gets fun. That's a Brian Broadus special right there. Is like I think you it know, is. I think it's it's the epitome of ice cream flavors. Like what do you like? I think everybody <laughs> would agree Okuda's in the class by himself. 
I think mm-hmm. most people agree that Henderson is in a class by himself as the second best guy. And then, uh, honestly, take a look and take your pick. I, I mean, Jeff Gladney, Christian Fulton. Um, oh, gosh, I'm having a break. Trevon Diggs. Who am I forgetting? Trevon Diggs. Yeah, Trevon yeah, Diggs yeah, is Trevon another one. Diggs. Which, like, I've seen Diggs. People have him as high as, like, a top 25 prospect, and other people have him as low as, you know, a guy the Cowboys could pick at 51. Same thing for Christian Fulton, honestly. And I think that's interesting because I think Diggs is such a freak athletically. I think it intrigues people. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, I'm a little higher on Fulton's technique, but he doesn't have the freakish measurables. Um, And then you can get into the Igbenogany. You can get into Cam Dantzler, like, I don't have a, a great answer for you. I think it's just all about personal preference based on your scheme and what you look for in a cornerback. I think they would take Trevon Diggs if Chase on C.J. Henderson, Ken Law dried out. I, I think they would wow. consider Trevon Diggs. You think they would do that I, at 17? I, I think they would. I think okay. they'd try to go back, but I think they would take – what I'm saying is I think they would take Diggs over Fulton. Um, I'm interested yeah. to see what they think about Gladney. I actually – I've got Gladney as my second cornerback. I like Gladney more than Henderson by a, by just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. But um, you know, you know, my my guy that I, I think deserves to start getting some third round talk. Maybe I know that that's outside the question of seventeen to fifty one. My guy Reggie Robinson. Are people sleeping on my guy here? Mm-hmm. I think they I are. Think I really do. He might sneak into the back of the second round too. Wow! You know, back in the, the second the, round. The, the, the thing about the cornerback class, uh, you guys mentioned it being kind of like uh, flavors of ice cream. It kind of depends on specified role. And I think outside of Akuda, and I don't think Akuda has probably gotten enough uh, attention and respect in terms of being like a top blue chip player because he's not a flashy athlete, but he's just a really good player, um, kind of like uh, Stefan Gilmore was. Uh, C.J. Henderson, when I talk to people, uh, people like the athleticism. There's been some questions about his – uh, lack of engagement when it came to tackling, but then there was an injury that will probably surface to say that he kind of played it, played it close, uh, played it close to the vest down to the end of the year. I think when you get below that, when you talk about Trayvon Diggs, AJ Terrell, Christian Foot Fulton, uh, there are people that have thrown Jalen Johnson from Utah in that yeah. conversation, Jeff Gladney from TCU. Uh, all of those guys can play on the outside. And I think as the league is trending, um, you want guys who can be tough guys, guys who can tackle, guys that will get people down because you can no longer hide the cover corner. Um, Cameron Danzler was someone that was getting a lot of attention prior to going at the combine. He ran slow, but I still doesn't think, I don't think that takes away from him being a really good player. And then when you go to what I would call the specialists, um, the Darnay Holmes that are guys that are ideally suited to play nickel, um, Amik Robertson, who is a guy who is oh, a ball yeah. hawk, who's tough enough to play on the edge. I really believe that depending on how you value cornerbacks and what you're looking for from a scheme standpoint, there are plenty of cornerbacks that you can pick from 17 to 50, 51 and be very, very satisfied that those guys are going to come in and start. So if you had to give a ballpark number really quickly from all three of you guys, would it be 5 Ten maybe corners that could be potentially taken in that realm. Two, three, four, five. That sounds about right. I'm gonna. I would split the difference and say like eight maybe. Yeah. I, I, I mean, would they, see how teams feel about Damon Arnett at Ohio yeah. State. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, actually Benogany from Auburn. Got to throw him in the mix. So yeah, eight to ten is a pretty good ballpark number. I think Arnett, yeah, I, I, I Arnett think is a good answer for the question you asked a minute ago about taking guys off your board. I think that's a guy only teams are going to know how they feel about him and his background. And, I mean, I like, again, we're hearing less than I think we typically do, but I think that's going to be a case-by-case thing for sure. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting what you guys bring up. Like, uh, I think typically on average in the first two rounds, you're dealing with about 13 to 14 corners that come off the board. Um this year, what is appealing about the cornerback class? A lot of six footers. Um, it's hard to find yeah. six foot cornerbacks in the league. And so this year, all the top guys that we talk about are all around that six foot or, or taller mark. And that gives them a chance to kind of match up with the big bodies that we've seen dominate at wide receivers. So there's a lot of intrigue on that. 
And a lot of these guys will come up and tackle. And I think A.J. Terrell is a guy that we haven't talked about him maybe enough in terms of being one of those guys that can sneak in. But when I talk to people, his versatility, being able to play outside and inside, his toughness, his ability to blitz, um, kind of serves him well to being a guy in the first round that kind of pops up and maybe goes a little higher than many of us think. I like it a lot. There are a lot of corners out there that could be in that realm. And uh, thanks to everyone who has sent in their Twitter on the 20 questions. We'll bring that back next week as well. But we're going to step aside when we come back. We've got some day three prospects. And we're going to give you that intrigue all of us a little bit. As we're three weeks out from the draft, we've got three third round or third day prospects coming up when we return here on the DallasCowboys.com draft show presented by Miller Lite. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American-made with pride right here in Texas. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Want to show your Texas and team pride, too? You can. By purchasing your own Stetson, you can look just like how the flag guys do on field at every home game. Stetson hats, the official crown of all self-respecting Cowboys and your favorite football team. Get yours today in the Stadium Pro Shop or at Stetson.com. Your new apartment's big. Such a great deal. Uh, it's okay. Just okay? What's not too... Right above the subway! Well, I bet you don't even notice it after the... That's my neighbor, Angus! A deal that's just okay is not okay. Get a great deal with America's Best Network. Come into an AT&T store to find out how to get one of our popular smartphones for $0 down. Based on GWS1 score September 2019. Essilor is a proud sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. Helping fans see more and do more with our best vision solutions. Our lens technologies reveal a world more beautiful than you can imagine. For a limited time, get the Essilor Next Gen offer. When you buy the latest generation of Transitions lenses with select Essilor lenses, you can choose a second pair of clear lenses for free with qualifying frame purchases. Restrictions apply. Find a participating eye care professional by visiting EssilorUSA.com. Essilor. See more. Do more. So, you're shopping. And that's when you see it. Aisle 23. Dr. Pepper stacked from top to bottom as far as the eye can see. The phrase too good to be true comes to mind, yet there it is. A rich, delicious Dr. Pepper paradise. Wait, did, did that can of Dr. Pepper just open itself for you? They all are. As if to say, so nice to treat you. And even though it feels weird to talk to a can, you pick one up and say, it's so nice to be treated. Dr. Pepper, so nice to treat you. This is is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Rolling into the final segment here of the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show, as always, presented by Miller Lite. Kyle Yeomans, David Hellman, Kevin Turner, and then Bucky Brooks joining the squad yet again for the first time since the Senior Bowl. Before we get into some of our favorite day three prospects, we've got some exciting news. And the props of having a bookshelf behind me is I get to pull out some of the past Dallas Cowboys magazine stars official draft guides And our 2020 version of the magazine is now officially available. And you can go buy your digital copy today, $4.95 online. You can go find it on the DallasCowboys.com website as well as on David's Twitter, on my Twitter. It's the 2020 Dallas Cowboys Star Magazine Draft Guide. 320 college players listed. A brand new look with tons of graphics and fun facts. You've got mock drafts and writing from each one of your favorite DallasCowboys.com staff writers, including the great David Hellman. Yeah, man, we put a lot in on this one. Uh, 320 players scouting reports on every position. Um, we are the Dallas Cowboys, so it's all got Cowboys slant. And find out exactly what this team needs to be looking at, what they might do in the draft. Uh, I did a first-round mock. Feel free to look at it and then mock me when it's drastically wrong in a month. <laughs> Uh, and I believe all, all of our writing staff did a seven-round mock, kind of give you an idea of what they might Ooh. be able to do in the draft. Team 40 Burger, C.D. Lamb, let's go. 
And that is the cover that you saw on the screen a couple moments ago and what Dave has in his hand as well. C.J. Henderson, Grant Delpit, C.D. Lamb. Some of our favorites here on the draft show presented by Miller Lite, but uh, also just uh, a great magazine to flip through. I'm excited to go read exactly what all the other uh, contributions were throughout the, the course of the magazine as it's going to be a, a great pickup. By the way, the digital copy, like I said, is available now. You can potentially pick up a print version we believe it's going to be in stores next week if not very soon after that so print versions and the hard copies will be available as well so moving on into our final segment we've got about 10 minutes left guys so we've got some day three value picks that we've all kind of written down we have three players each kt we're going to start with you just because i like your guys a lot overall and kind of give me three day three value picks this doesn't necessarily have to be for the Dallas Cowboys, but it just so happens that it ends up being in a lot of the positions of need. Well, yeah, and I, I'll start with a guy who you guys know I'm pretty responsible with my draft picks, and I think about the salary cap a lot. There's an offensive tackle from South Carolina State, Alex Taylor, who I really like on day three. He's so raw. He's got 88 inch arms. He's six eight, but he doesn't move like it because he's only 310 <laughs> pounds. Like you'd expect him to be like 340 pounds. He's not. Um, he's going to need development, but let's get him in the system on day three, and maybe he's your future Tyron Smith replacement down the road. If you trust the development of your players, I really like Alex Taylor from South Carolina State. Uh, Travis Gibson, edge rusher from Tulsa. You know, I like about him, he's got a little good jolt off the line of scrimmage. He'll, he'll pop the guy back a little bit. Don't know how bendy he is. Um, you know, 6'3", 250, but last year had eight sacks at Tulsa. And I think he does a good job of, you know, playing with his long arms, getting off blocks. I think he could be a really solid day three value pick. And then it's kind of my poor man's, like, Taylor Rapp guy is Jalen Elliott, the safety from Notre Dame on day three. He ran a 4-8-0 at the Combine, so I realize the red flags are up, but... I just like his demeanor. I think he's solid. I don't think people talked about him enough at the Senior Bowl. I think he had a good week there. Everyone was really talking about Troy Pride, but I thought Jalen Elliott had an excellent week at the Senior Bowl. And uh, So those are three guys I really like on day three who kind of fit some needs for the Cowboys. I like Jalen Elliott a lot. You talked about how he made some noise at the Senior Bowl. I thought he had a better week than Troy Pride Jr. because I went in looking at Troy Pride and – I'm thinking he was going to show out in the Chrome Dome, but instead it was it was Jalen Elliott. Dave, who you got as some day three guys? All right, I want to talk about this guy because I'm I'm fascinated. And KT's talking about being responsible. I'm I'm looking for value. Like it's day three. Is there a guy out there who's better than that who I can find? And a name that I absolutely love, but there's there's some uncertainty there, which makes it intriguing. Is Julian Blackman out of Utah, uh, the safety? Mm. If you're not familiar with his body of work, three time All Conference, three three years in college, he's he's All Conference. Played cornerback for two, switches to safety his final season, and the guy's All America. Uh, four interceptions, had a fantastic season. Suffers a non-contact injury in the Pac-12 title game. And, and misses the bowl game. He's still rehabilitating. I have not been able to find information on this anywhere. Like, there's not a lot of information about what it is, what happened to him. I've talked to people who don't have a lot of information, don't know where his health is at, don't know how long it's going to take him to recover, which is why he's a day three pick. Like, if he's f- perfectly healthy, we're talking about this guy in the second round, I think. Because you go watch his tape. Utah throws him back there. Like he plays a lot of single high, plays a lot of deep free safety. He's got great instincts. He's a willing tackler. And like I said, he had four picks. Uh, good ball skills. Like I would draft this guy in the second round if I wasn't worried about his health. And so, I teams have got to get to the bottom of that. And it makes me wonder how far he's going to fall. And if you can draft him on day three, even if he's not like 100% ready his rookie season, I think that's still probably a good get um so i love that thought um another guy i threw up there is is daryl williams the center out of mississippi state talk about losing travis frederick i don't want to draft a replacement in the first three rounds um Mm -hmm. but williams played guard and center at mississippi state like he's he's certainly not like an elite level center 
Um, but I like his flexibility. And again, if you're talking about like a sixth round pick, a guy who can play guard and center, love that. Uh, we're familiar with my third guy, Kendall Vildor from the Senior Bowl. Had a great week down there in Mobile. I wanted to give him some shine because we talk about Dane Jackson all the time. Like, Dane Jackson is definitely one of my pet cats in this draft. Um, but I, I like Vildor, too. Had a great Senior Bowl week. Had a fantastic showing at the Combine. Uh, ran a 4-4-4. Um, so, again, if you're talking about doubling up at cornerback, that's another guy that if you want to draft him on day three to go with – a day one or day two cornerback. I absolutely love that. All right, let's hear about Bucky's boys. Well, you guys mentioned my <clears> – <throat> you talk about having a pet cat. My pet cat is from Kentucky. It's Lynn, it's Lynn Bowden. And yes! I don't expect let's him – Let's go. I don't expect him to be there day four, but there's so many wide receivers that he could fall to, to, to day three and be a fourth-round pick. But when you talk about an ATH – an athlete, he is a Swiss Army knife that every offense could benefit from. And in fact, Dallas just had Randall Cobb. I think he's Randall Cobb plus. He's more accomplished yeah. than what Randall Cobb was at Kentucky in terms of running the football and being able to do a lot of things. He hasn't been talked about to the level that he should. He is a really, really good player. He's kind of that Julian Edelman, Heinz Ward, do everything playmaker. He is someone that should go. But if you like, if, if, if he's too highly regarded, then Isaiah Coulter from Rhode Island is someone that I like. Smooth route runner, does a great job of catching the ball, wins the 50-50, uh, showed up, ran well, ran faster than most people anticipated. He has a chance um, at running back. Maryland had a running back, Anthony McFarland. Because Tony Pollard has so much success, their teams are looking to find that guy. Anthony McFarland could be that guy. A bit of a pocket rocket, super explosive. But when you go back and look two years ago against Ohio State, he had 200 yards on the ground. He is someone that can pick up steam. And then my final guy, because I got a bonus pick, Evan Weaver for Cal. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't necessarily talk about the guy that looks like Buzz Lightyear. But when you look at the production, 400-plus <laughs> tackles uh, during his career at Cal. Ran 4.76 at the combine, which quieted a lot of critics. Smart, tough, physical typically plays for a while in our league. He is someone that is undervalued but can play for a long time. I like it. I like it. And, I mean, going back to your first guy, I think Lynn Bowden Jr. is one of the greatest value picks you could even have in this kind of draft. And that just kind of goes to the depth of wide receiver because I think, like you said, there's so many wide receivers in front of him. He's going to fall back a little bit. He's going to be right back in that fourth-round conversation, maybe into the third. I think he should go in the third. But if he's there in the fourth, I don't see why not. Uh, somebody's yeah. going to take a chance on him. Okay, so my three guys really quickly. Oh, go for it, Bucky. No, I, real, oh, real quick, Kyle. I'm, I'm sorry, Kyle. Real, <laughs> Bucky. If, in your expert opinion, where do you think that you would have to draft Lynn Bowden? You said you kind of doubt he falls to the fourth. Like, is that realistic? You know, I don't know because there's so many. Like, just think about the number of wide receivers that are there. I would think third round is a good spot for him because he brings so many things. Um, but we've seen stranger things happen in the draft. Who knows where he falls? All right. Sorry, Kyle. I've seen ahead. stranger things. Yeah, you're good. But just real quickly, my three guys, I've got McTelvin. They call him uh, – oh, man, what was his name? I forgot his uh, – oh, Sosa. Ajim? They call him Sosa Ajim from Arkansas, a guy who was a top ten rated uh, defensive tackle, according to Pro Football Focus. A, a little bit small in the lower half is what I have in, in his scouting report. But he's a good pass rusher. He projects as a three technique, but I, I think he could play the one. I think he ended up playing nose tackle for about 20% of his snaps while at Arkansas. Dominated the Shrine game, was a late addition to the Senior Bowl, and actually performed well on both ends. And a guy who went up against SEC talent throughout his career with the Razorbacks, he's somebody that I think could be a value and I think will be there day three. And some somebody who's going to need a, a heavy pass rusher up the middle or a quick, maybe more of a finesse pass rusher than uh, than a, a heavy one just because I think he's got a couple of moves that are in a vast arsenal of moves that could potentially go in his favor. Another guy, let's go to the safety position. This is a guy that uh, Dane Brugler mentioned at the Combine, but this is Kenny Robinson out of the XFL, the St. Louis Battlehawks. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy who 
you you look at the kind of situation around the XFL initially, and it was going right up until the draft. Now with COVID nineteen throwing a wrench into that season and into the entire process, he'll potentially be picked up without a chance to finish off his XFL season, which put, could potentially push him down some draft boards. But I like him a lot. He's a good cover safety. He's a ball hawk overall. Uh, could come up and play slot corner. Could go and play a little bit of box safety, but he's more of a free. And, and I think he's a guy who shows some versatility at that position. And then my last guy, Shaquille Quarterman from Miami. And this is kind of one of those very niche-oriented prospects. If you're going to blitz a lot of your linebackers and you're going to find a way to, to rush with your edge linebacker, that's kind of the fit that he's going to fill. If he's going back in coverage, he's a liability. That's why he's going to fall to day three, but he's got a lot of tools. He's got a potential to, to really kind of uh, show some niche uh, talent there overall as, a, as an edge rusher, but I like what he has in store, and I think if you put him in a 3-4 and let him co- uh, try and rush a quarterback, I think he's potentially going to be – uh, a guy who could present some value. But those are my three guys overall. I like that. There's a lot of day three guys that kind of get me excited about it. Hell yeah. I mean, dude, that's, what's, that's where it gets real fun is like when you're trying to pick out, oh, wait, wait, we're talking 17, we're talking 51. No, who are they going to take at 178? That's what I want to know. That's where it gets really fun. <laughs> that is where it gets fun, and we'll have all that coverage for you throughout the entire draft process. But that is going to do it here for this edition of the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show presented by Miller Lite. Bucky Brooks, thanks so much for stopping in and joining thanks, us here Bucky. this morning. It's been a, a blast Thank talking you. with hey, you again, man. It was fun. A lot of fun, guys. A lot of fun. But just want to remind you one more time, go get your digital edition. This, these are the old print editions, but you can get your digital edition of the Dallas Cowboys Star Magazine Draft Guide. And also, I'm about to go eat me some of the Papa John's that they've got uh, delivered as well. So I'm going to go take my Papa John's pizza and scarf that down because it's lunchtime and I'm starving. But for Bucky Brooks, below me for KT down in the bottom right-hand corner and for David Hellman to my left showing off the new Dallas Cowboys draft guide, I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long for this week's edition of the DallasCowboys.com draft show. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!